Okay, I, I think maybe we'll just start then. Um, um, I'm Kathy Shane. I am the chair of the elementary school building committee and I'm wake, welcoming everyone who managed to figure out how to join us this morning to today's community forum on the school. I have the privilege of leading this off as we are really at um, a key juncture as Amherst takes the next steps toward building a new elementary school. And Tim is going, Tim Cooper from Danisco is gonna operate the slides. So Tim, if you wanna put them up, and go to the first slide. Um, my role today is to provide an overview of the project. We are, as we're going to describe, we really see this as we're building for the future for our children, for our community, and for our climate. I'm gonna give an overview of the project, the project status, then Donna Danisco of Danisco Designs, our architect, and Tim Cooper, I believe, are gonna provide you with the vision that we've come up with um, as we begin to get much more specific about what the school and the site will look like. And Margaret Wood from Answer Advisory, our owner's project manager, and that's the person she's critical in keeping us on track and doing all the paperwork for the Massachusetts School Building Authority that will enable us to secure a facility grant. And as you can see, we're a 13 member building committee of which I am the chair. Next slide, please. As we've looked at the school, one of the things we've focused on right from the get-go is education. With the decline in enrollment in our elementary schools, we can combine two schools that are currently operating well below capacity in buildings that have little to no insulation, have aging, inefficient heating and cooling systems, and were built in an era where air circulation, use of fossil fuels, and energy costs were not central concerns. As Donna will discuss, the education needs of the students and teachers inform the design with a focus on student-centered learning and an ability to work in small groups. Throughout the building, teachers and students will benefit from daylight within the building and, in, and be part of a site with robust outdoor spaces for learning, including teaching about the environment and natural resources. Very excitingly, this will be our town's first net zero building. The design will meet the town's net zero bylaw in a well-insulated all-electric building with PV arrays to offset utility costs. We expect to save at least $250,000 a year in operating costs, utility costs. Throughout, we focused on cost. The selection of Fort River as a site will ease the way we build because we're gonna have the current school open. There'll be less disruption during construction. One school moving from three schools down to one will save on operating costs. And throughout, um, and Donna will discuss this more, the building committee and the designer have focused on selecting durable yet lower cost materials in a, in a very efficient three-story building. We expect to receive a facility grant from MSBA with official notice in April. But the cost of the school, given other needs of the town, will require a debt exclusion vote to help pay for the town share. This is currently scheduled for May 2nd. Today and tomorrow's forum are the beginning of multiple community efforts. There'll be ample opportunities to provide comments and participate as we move from the overall design and building design to specifics with the goal of opening a school in 2026. I'm now going to turn it over to Donna, who will provide a vision of the school. And we think the emerging design, both of the site and the building are incredibly exciting and give a sense of that we really are building for the future. Donna, it's all yours. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Um, Tim, if you wanna just advance, thanks. So as Kathy mentioned, really the educational program drove the design and we received approval in let's say, almost a year ago, which is hard to believe, um, 
the program components and the areas for each of the programs totaling a program area of 70,500 net floor area. And that's a square footage of the spaces um, in, with, within the four walls of the spaces. And from that, we have a grossing factor of 1.5. So the total gross square footage of the building is 105,750 square feet. The program areas um, and the gross square footage have not changed. Uh, we are committed to staying within the approved square footages for the building. But what we've spent the last year on and, and we've continued to refine is the spatial relationships and adjacencies for the students and staff to ensure that we maximize time on learning, that the students have the resources and the uh, staff that are needed to support the programs are within close proximity to each other. So this is a huge shout out for everyone um, that has been involved. We really appreciate everything that um, you've done, your input and being so available to us. Next. So as we look at the Fort River site, you'll see the dashed in existing building to the north. And this building will remain in operation, the school re will remain in operation while the construction of the new building will occur to the south of the site. And there will be spaces behind the building for um, outdoor activities, recess and outdoor learning, that will not change. There'll be a fence separating the school functions and the construction. So there'll be clear separation. And actually, I might give a little peek, peek holes through some of the fencing so the kids can actually see the construction of their new building, which is also an educational opportunity. Um, once the new school is completed, we'll move the students in over the summer of 2026. Our goal is to start demolishing the existing building over the summer of 2026 while the students are not on site. So the fence line will remain, but the activities will switch. The students then will occupy the new school and they'll have access around the school for uh, recess and outdoor learning. And then in the fall of, it's probably gonna be late fall, for um, the completion of the site work, which will be filling and completing the community fields to the north. I want to just emphasize that the field sizes and types are placeholders right now, and that uh, fi that final determination doesn't need to occur right now. Next slide, Tim. So we just wanted to share a little bit about circulation and traffic. We understand, you know, combining two schools with an enrollment of 575 students is a little bit more than what you currently have. The Tim, if you want to be my eyes and ears would be great. I don't know if we can see your mouse, but um, yep, yeah, thanks. The south entrance will be the bus drop off entrance and we're able to accommodate the 12 buses that will come in through the loop. And uh, there is going to be a drop off area right here and we'll show um, through our video or movie, you'll see the entrance, how we're trying to celebrate that area. We have a van pull off area as well, which we understand is critically important as those students need additional time to arrive and depart in the morning. To the north, the north entrance will be for staff parking and for uh, parent drop off. So they'll enter from the north and there's ample queuing of at least 60 cars to go up to um, pretty much where the um, end of the existing building is. But if we need to, we have you know ample space for additional queuing as well. We're currently providing handicapped parking, as you'll see close to the building, but also close to the fields as, as we really want to embrace this as a community, um, a, a community project with 100, approximately 170 parking spaces. And then if we zoom in a little bit closer to the larger effort that's going to occur, we've spent a lot of time working on outdoor learning 
embracing the site as part of the outdoor learning while providing play areas for the students that can occur year round. So you'll see the two circles to the north with the play, play rectangle. That will be um, play equipment for the students. Our goal is to have a younger playground and an upper, um, upper student, upper uh, older student playground with a play area in between that can be utilized for, that can be plowed and that will be soft surface. So students actually have a place to play during the winter months. Um, we've also provided and are thinking about outdoor dining. Um, we, we understand how popular that is, which is a wonderful opportunity. So we are thinking about, you know, where we can put um, picnic tables or outdoor seating areas for them. You'll see all the squiggly lines that come through the site. That's all going to be hard surface that will also be plowed and the students will have ample opportunity there um, to play, whether it's Foursquare or Gaga Pit or whatever. And we're gonna take some time over the next phase to engage the students and find out what's important to them. We have some community basketball hoops. Uh, two, we have two full size and then a couple of half courts as well. And what we've done is we've thought carefully about how we can integrate outdoor learning. What you see in the blue are our uh, rain gardens for stormwater management, but we really believe that these can be wonderful outdoor learning opportunities. We have a garden area um, and a cultivation garden that you'll see it will appear better in the um, video. Thanks, Tim. We can go to the next slide. So we see many familiar faces in, in this morning's community forum. So thank you for staying with us throughout. But we just wanna share a little bit. We have the main entrance um, to the West that visitors, students and staff will enter. We have the main office right at the front and that will be the gatekeeper the, that will have oversight to the arrival both for the buses and for visitors, staff and students arriving by car. The community wing, which is at the front of the building, we have the gymnasium and the cafetorium. It says platform, but that will be your stage that can be um, used by the community while the academic wing, which is in purple, can be closed off so that we maintain that separation. There's an elevator right uh, there you go. We have an elevator as well that won't necessarily be needed for community use, but there is an elevator throughout the building. When you enter the academic wing, what you'll see is five classrooms per grade. It was very important to create in a small school feel, and the, we think the videos will probably sh show you better than this, but you have three classrooms surrounded by a project area, sharing a project area. And the project area will support the classrooms for small group instruction, project-based learning, individualized learning. And the classrooms are grouped in a way that each grade is clustered together for collaboration amongst in the entire grade. We have two grades per floor. So that also further enhances the collaboration vertically as well as horizontally. We have taken great lengths to locate the special education spaces to support all students and make sure that they had access to their peers. If you go to the next slide on the second floor, as we go upstairs, you'll start seeing that the building starts getting kind of like a tiered, kind of like a cake. On the second floor, um, to the west, we have what we're calling the STEM areas. We have the media center, the art and the science technology and engineering room. We're really looking forward to working with everyone on how we can make the even lobby area of that space, the corridor area of that space become part of the project-based learning that occurs in these spaces. Again, you'll see the academic wing is identical to the floor below, 
two grades, second and third grade, shared project areas along with the support spaces needed for those grades. And then we go up to the third floor um, as, as the older students um, move up in grade, we also think they get to move up on in the floor. So they have the privilege of being on the third floor. Sure, they're gonna feel pretty special about that. And again, very simple layout. The floor plan was intentional, intentionally simple both for the students to be comfortable with getting through and around the building, but also it is a, a great construction method to maintain a simple construction and reduce cost. So that's the floor plans. Now what we'll do is just share with you some visuals and I'm gonna turn this over to Tim. Thank you, Don. Uh, so we're going to start with a view of the front entrance uh, where the parents would drop off on the west side of the building. Uh, at the left of the frame, you can see some of the canopies that will exist in the parking lot uh, and support the PV that will get the building to net zero. As we begin to move around, you can see the administration to the right of the main entrance. So they will have view of children entering the site from both drop off loops. Uh, the building at the west side is brought down from the three stories, uh, so it's more in keeping with uh, the existing buildings in town. Uh, moving to the north through the first playground, you can see the media center on the second floor and the cafeteria all glassy and open to the views to the north. Uh, the materials of the building are masonry, which are cost effective, very durable, but there is a full palette of color available that uh, brings the appropriate uh, whimsy, if you will, that is we want for an elementary school. Uh, moving around to the east side of the site, uh, there are the hardscape play areas, including basketball. You can begin to see the rain gardens here that are part of the stormwater management features of the site, as well as educational opportunities. Um, circling around, we're getting to the planter and pollinator gardens, which are part of the school curriculum. There's also a space that is set aside or outdoor traditional classroom with furniture. And it's not shown here, but there will be a covered area. Um, as we turn around, we get to the southern side of the building. You can see there is solar control on the windows on this side to prevent glare. Uh, but each of these classrooms has ample uh, window space for natural daylight, which has been a driver of the project since the very beginning. Here is the entrance that students taking the bus to school we'll use on the south side of the building. And then we move past the gymnasium. Um, outdoor art murals have been mentioned often and we have large expanses of the gym wall that we have kept open for that purpose or maybe somewhere else in the building. Here you can see we're circling around back to the very beginning of the building. Now we're gonna move inside. Uh, walking into the lobby through a secure vestibule, the Office of Administration is right on your right. We want a light-filled, colorful lobby that will invite you into the space. But uh, it's ample and comfortable, but very quickly you're into the heart of the building. You see a stair ahead of you that will get you to the upper floors. To the right is the gymnasium, uh, which will be light-filled, uh, but the light will be controlled so as not to interfere with activities in there. And circling around, you can see the cafeteria, which is also very glassy and very light, with views to the fields to the north, um, and then connected to uh, the music room, which is available in the lobby. The entire space is designed to be light filled and inviting. Moving into the academic areas, these are the project areas outside the classroom clusters. There are lockers for all the students and storage above that for the teachers. Uh, there you can see the furniture for full-out learning and project-based learning. Uh, Notice by the classroom doors, there are very large side lights and transom above to let light into the interior spaces um, and a connection to the outside. So someone in the project areas can see the outside. And then moving into the classrooms, uh, you can see those large windows. These ones are facing south, so you can see the solar control. There are two sinks in every classroom, uh, lots of storage. Um, you can see here in the whiteboard, lots of opportunity for uh, small groups. 
and the connection to the circulation of the corridors throughout the building is very important. Uh, there's now we're going to move into the media center. Uh, you can see here uh, there is, in addition to all of the books, there is space with technology for a full size class to learn. There is also a reading and storytelling area, in addition to the support spaces that the librarians, circulation desk, lots of blazing light filled walls to let light into the building. And then the library itself. So this is a glimpse of your new building. I know it seems like, gee, it's 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 ready. We're we're done. Um, we're not. <laughs> we have quite a bit of time left. Um, so, uh, but but these are the tools that we'll use to continue to help you envision what your new school will be in just a few short years. Um, so, Tim, let's go to the next slide. So where we are right now is, uh, and, and many folks have probably heard how the uh, construction continues to inflate. Um, we continue to have market conditions, material uh, delivery issues, um, but, but we have a construction cost of, I'm just gonna use round numbers here because this is still schematic design, but this is the world of estimating. Um, the total construction cost is approximately $86,700,000. Um, we recognize this was higher than where we were at the end of the study of preferred schematic. The committee worked extremely hard in selecting items that can be eliminated or removed from the project without any um, problem or, or um, any deficit to the educational program, to the design intent, to the sustainability of the building, which was so important. So we're currently, uh, the construction cost is 81,300,000 or 81,400,000. And Margaret, I think you're gonna go over the overall project cost. I am, so. Um... So one of my roles, as Kathy said earlier, I'm sort of generally in charge of, you know, doing project coordination, but another um, big part of my role is to develop the overall project budget. And as Kathy said, to um, develop the documents that the MSBA requires that document it. So um, this um, slide gives you an overview of that. You know, as Donna said, um, we're at an early stage and the specificity of these numbers, um, like the, the detail of the drawings, has a tendency, I think, to make people think like it's really done. So you should think of these numbers as really as rounded numbers, but for the purposes of the funding agreement, we actually have to put in specific numbers tied to the estimate. So just taking it from the top, um, the process that we're in right now, feasibility, um, is not part of the MSBA calculation for two reasons. One is that the MSBA isn't um, sort of pro providing um, subsidy for it, and it was also separately funded. So it's up at the top, but if you sort of roll through these numbers, it's not included in the addition. So as Donna said in the last slide, right now we are at an estimated construction cost of, let me, I'm gonna call it 81.4. Um, was an excellent process getting to that number. So the soft, what are the so-called soft costs, uh, which are the parts of, build, of project costs that are not part of the building, fall in three buckets. One is fees, and there's, as you can imagine, quite a few people involved. In addition to the consultant teams you see here, Answer Advisory and Dinesco, there's a whole slew of consultants and testing agencies and other individuals that provide services. So right now, that number stands at a little over 9.7 9 million in total. Um, then there is a budget line item for furnishings, equipment and technology. Um, you know, For those of you who have been in newer schools recently, um, the 
the issue just of the furnishings, not even to touch on the technology and the importance of them and transforming education cannot be discounted. The real question is what appropriate number should we hold now for something that isn't gonna get purchased for a couple of years? So right now we're using a working number of um, 2 million. It is possible because that hasn't been reviewed with the building committee. Um, it may move higher before we make the submission. It probably, it will not be less than that. Um, then we also carry within the total project budget contingencies that protect the community um, against the possibility of change over the course of the project. So there's a so-called hard construction contingency, which in this case is we're recommending a contingency of 5%. So um, that uh, 4.4 uh, million is really just 5% of the construction number above. And then the soft cost contingency is 1% of the construction above. So hard costs would be, there's a change in the construction cost. Soft costs would be, there are some additional services that might be required. Um, and that rolls up to, let's call it $98 million. And then um, there's a fairly complicated um, calculation that the MSDBA does behind the scenes, but it's, it's basically a, uh, it's based on a, a dollar per square foot that they reimburse on projects, um, as well as some subsidy of the soft costs. That number I am estimating at this point is 42.7. And that leaves the town's share of the total of the 98 million at uh, let's call it 55.3 million. And then um, as uh, Donna did on the previous slide, um, I'm also showing the one half percent for art below the line. So my at this point, I would say the project is, let's call it 55 point six, 55.5, 50.6, in terms of what the town, the community needs to fund. So next slide just briefly summarizes, <clears throat> super short slide. So there's that number up at the top, the 55.5. There are um, several sources of funding that we believe will reduce that. So one is, um, a, pretty big number of 1.6 million, which is based on rebates that the project is getting from Eversource uh, for, uh, sorry, it's National Grid, right? <laughs> no, it's Eversource. From Eversource for um, the high energy performance of the building. And then there's money from the Community Preservation Act um, that is pending council approval that is going to subsidize the cost of the fields which are being built as part of the project. And the big open question mark is there are federal tax credits for the photovoltaics um, that are the, the, num the way that's gonna be calculated has not yet been published. So uh, we're still waiting to find out what that is, so. And the next slide is um, the milestone schedule. And this is gonna conclude the presentation. So just to give you a, an overview. So um, we're here today and tomorrow in the community forum. Um, that in the early February council is going to discuss the debt authorization. And it will at that point get referred to the finance committee. Finance committee meets shortly after that. Um, at the end of February, town council will take up the debt exclusion language and the finance committee will discuss the debt authorization. Um, for the consultants, a really big milestone is that we submit the package of all the materials we've been developing to the MSBA on March 2nd. Um, the MSBA board will vote on the project on April 26th. In the meantime, uh, the finance committee and council will take up the death, their, their side of the debt authorization. And then right after the MSBA board meeting on May 2nd will be the debt exclusion vote. Uh, 
And then there's a lot of work that gets done, but um, where we're headed is opening the building, as Donna and Tim mentioned, in August of 2026. I think that's the last slide. It is. So Tim, perfect. So thank you, everyone. I'm, I First, we'd like to say thank you to so many that have followed along, but have also provided input to really make this um, a, a special project for the community of Amherst. But we are wanting to spend the rest of our time uh, having a conversation with you all. So I don't, I don't know if we raise hands. Um, we have a moderator behind the scenes here. Maybe if, if folks would like to ask any questions or any comments, feel free to raise your hand. I'm gonna see how to do this. Tim, maybe if you wanna, um, well, let's start with Sarah. Yeah, that might be easier. Sarah, you should be able to unmute. You got two, you got a pick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sarah Ross. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, that's so funny. Yes, sorry. <laughs> and we're neighbors, so, you know. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Okay, Sarah with the eight. Uh, thank you so much. This is just, I mean, the first thing I want to say is this is so awesome. And I am so excited about this project. It is, uh, it's clear there's so much hard work that's gone into this. Um, you guys have made such great choices all along the way uh, that are going to serve our town and generations to come of students in this town. So I'm really excited for all the future students that are gonna to get to enjoy this building. Um, and it, you know, it's really gonna set up a virtuous circle where you know, we will have a better time recruiting new teachers, retaining new teachers. It's gonna support health and learning of students. So there's just so much that's, that's good here. Um, as we move through this you know, kind of difficult process of trying to make the dollars work uh, certainly would encourage you all to continue to look at, um, you know, finishes and, you know, choices for the exterior where we can both reduce cost and potentially reduce the embedded carbon of, you know, some of the materials. I think that's a win-win. And then the other, the other piece I just wanted to ask about was the, the federal incentives piece as being shown, you know, just related to the photovoltaics, my understanding is that's also applicable to the ground source heat pump. And so we've got really a sizable chunk that's expected there. And so, you know, want to make sure that we are commuting, communicating to the community that these green choices are actually the most affordable, you know, likely from both an initial cost and as we operate the building going forward. You know, Kathy highlighted that nicely at the beginning. But my understanding is that these federal incentives are really um, the most affordable cost for us uh, in this project. So want to thank you all for the hard work and look forward to supporting this project as it moves through these next critical stages. Thank you so much. Yeah, the other Sarah, <laughs> Sarah Marshall. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, I love this building. It's beautiful. I like uh, the massing. Uh, it's very interesting in how you've used color. Um, it's very attractive. I have a bunch of questions. Some are very small. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw out three what I think are little ones, and then you can perhaps just answer them all. One can first, can you compare the footprints of the old and the new Fort River building? It looks like the new one might have a slightly smaller footprint. Um, second, can you explain, I think I know, but can you explain why you're flexing the building in the middle? Um, bending, so it's not just one long block. Um, and thirdly, is this, is what you've shown us still the schematic design? And if so, um, or at some point, will you explain what happens next? I'll Tim, stop there for now, thank you. Great, thank you. Tim, if you could bring up a the first site plan. It's just so much easier. Yeah, I think he's trying to pull it up. 
So to answer your first question, as Tim's um, hopefully going to be able to bring up the presentation, the existing um, single story building is uh, approximately 80 to, uh, if you go up to Tim, if you could, is approximately 82,000 square feet, um, single story. There you go. And what our current footprint is approximately 40 five, right, Tim, 45,000 square feet. So, so it's almost half the footprint of the uh, existing building. And we find that really important for many reasons, uh, site conditions for one. But when you start looking at the overall site, you'll see as we came around the building in the video, you'll see that you really end up being able to take advantage of this beautiful site and, and making it even a better community resource. So yes, uh, almost half the footprint size of the existing building. Um, the flex or the kind of V-shaped in, in the middle, um, Tim, I'll let you chime in as well, but this really was to maximize, uh, we have to be um, mindful of the setbacks, the wetland setbacks and everything that we have on the site. But we also wanted to break up the building a little bit so that you don't have a long run for um, just a very straight building, trying to break up the scale once you're in the building. Tim, yeah. is there anything you want to add to that? I, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, the optimal daylight orientation for the classrooms is in Oregon style. So the little flex maintains that while allowing the entrance to face where most of the cars are coming from. Donna mentioned the setbacks at the south of the site, so that allows us to pull the building out. So it's actually a combination of a lot of factors, including um, there is a corridor on the first floor. The building is smaller than the existing building, but uh, just having a, a light-filled node at the center of that corridor is a, a bit more comfortable and, and human scale than uh, a corridor that runs the length of the building. So it was a culmination of a lot of design decisions. And then, yes, um, this is a still schematic design. Um, so we have approximately a year to finish our design. The next phase is design development. Uh, once, once we receive funding to move forward, we'll spend um, some time refining the design and then the construction document phase, which really just gets into the level of detail on the drawings to ensure that the contractor fully understands the scope and will be able to construct this um, based upon their bids and uh, constructability for the building. So Sarah, I think that might've answered all your questions. Yes, I have more, but uh, please call on other people if there are other hands. I don't, can I, I don't have a hand. Oh, <laughs> we see your hand. Um, uh, Richard, let me just uh, go to Claire and then we'll come to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I too am so impressed with this design. And uh, my questions are mostly about the site and some of the choices. Um, one, one is, um, do we have anything in this budget that addresses the demolition of Fort River? Because I do understand Fort, I'm sorry, Wildwood, because I understand the old Fort River demolition is part of this budget. So that's one question. Another is what is done um, to make sure this school doesn't um, sit in any wetness the way the old Fort River did? I see based on my very inexperienced eye, but, um, it looks to me like this new school is actually closer to the actual Fort River. And so I just wonder if you could talk about what has been done. And then just one other question um, about the intersection. When I look at the, um, the, the parking lot entry, not the new planned um, school bus drop entry, but the other one, it looks to me like it's been moved but I'm not certain. And I wondered, I know there's a lot of concern about how traffic in and out of there would impact that light. And I wondered if there's any money um, in this budget to address that, or if that's something that will come to the town for further investment. I just wondered where we are with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
well, maybe Kathy, do you want to talk about the Wildwood School? Uh, the, the, the short answer, Claire, is the Wildwood School isn't touched by this, it's left. Um, so the decision on what to do with Wildwood, if this goes forward, we actually had a discussion yesterday in the Finance Committee on, uh, we have other properties, including South Amherst School, on to talk about what we want to do with that piece. And that will be the first, the Mike and the school, the school have to release the building if it becomes vacant as a school. And then we talk about what to do with it, including, I think there are a range of possibilities. So it's not scheduled on the de demolition level here. Um, so that's my answer on Wildwood. Thank and you. Tim, do you want to just talk about what we're doing to mitigate the high water table? Um, so we've done several things, actually. Uh, the new building first is two feet. The first floor level is two feet above the existing first floor of the existing building. That one brings it out of the groundwater. Also, we've added layers of drainage below the slab and uh, porous spill, which will allow the water to flow away and break the capillary action of the soil. So it's a combination of making one, the ground beneath it, not able to transmit the water up and two, raising the building itself up. And you did mention that it's closer to the river, but the site slopes down and the building is up. So the difference between the building and the ground around it is actually significantly higher than the the old location, it will slope up gradually to the front door from the parking lot, but there is actually a considerable grade change from um, the area of the the building to the building itself. It's several feet down from the building to the garden over here. And then the other question, the entrance at the north end of the site has been moved to the south, and the reason for doing that is to give more area for cue of the light on the street so that traffic entering and exiting this site will not uh, conflict with that queue to the extent possible. And, I, and, and Donna, I can answer Claire on the outside. Once you leave the school, the intersections, the town is looking actively at that because we have some housing developments coming in in this whole neighborhood. And that's where there are state grants to talk about intersections and changes in the way those are designed. So there's nothing in this budget that would do anything beyond the school property. So m move the entrance, but, um, um, and there's been an active discussion that goes beyond just the school on improving um, the way all of those roads come together. Uh, Claire, is that good? Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Richard? Yeah, thank you. I, I, you know, I didn't think I would have to remember this, but I'm actually the alumnus of two three-story elementary schools over in Northampton, Vernon Street and Florence Grammar. And I actually think they used the fourth floor of the basement in those two buildings. So uh, I know that some people have asked questions about three stories, like it's alien territory, but actually earlier in the last century, there were, I think there were plenty of three-story elementary schools. Um, I also want to express my thanks with some empathy for the people who have worked on this project with little or no compensation, because my sense of this is no community wastes volunteer time and effort, determined volunteer time and effort, quite like the town of Amherst. So my, I have two questions. One, um, 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 could you? I wonder if you could take us through what the um, elements that make this a net zero energy building. And secondly, as somebody who doesn't believe in something for nothing, I know you've glossed over this, but I'm, I guess I'm asking uh, how what got forfeited or sacrificed to cut $5.3 million out of the cost of the project? What were the features that you originally wanted that have gone away because we're cutting the cost by 5.3 million. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And, and we cannot uh, have said it better. This committee and, and many others were have just 
poured their heart and souls into this project. And it, it really could not be where we are today without everyone's um, support and input. Uh, apparently, we had a net zero slide or a sustainability slide that I don't know what happened, um, got eliminated. But the, we're utilizing ground source heat pumps uh, for it's going to be an all electric building. Let's just start there. And it, we're utilizing ground source heat pumps to uh, facilitate the distribution of the heating and cooling within the building. And it is gonna be offset by the PVs that will be installed or the electricity will be generated by the photovoltaics or um, that will be installed on the roof and in the parking lots. Um, there, there's some other really wonderful sustainable features that will, we're currently tracking LEED Gold right now, which is really commendable. Um, it also includes water reduction it includes uh, what we call a heat island, a reduction in heat island, so not to heat up the pavement and the site. It includes, um, we go as far as indoor air quality, which is really vitally important to the staff and students, acoustics. And then it, we're even having a construction waste management plan to be able to separate all of the construction material, and also the demolition of the building and making sure that it all just doesn't go to landfill. Kathy? I just want to add, Richard, the other part of this building, and, and Margaret showed those Eversource uh, incentives. Part of it is for construction. Uh, the building, because of its insulation, is very energy efficient. And so those incentives are based on the calculation that the um, the experts have done on the energy use of the building. So cutting down um, the energy use also allowed us to be efficient on how many PV panels need to be put on the roof and the, the parking lot. So, so there was a whole equation on uh, uh, the electrical use, the heating use, the, the flow. So it is, it's a highly efficient building. Um, and, and one of the things I forgot to say in my intro or you, but when these buildings have been built, we've seen one school and we're hoping ours will, it becomes a place where the kids can learn about all of this. You know, they're going to be able to, there'll be monitors, there'll be feedback loops. So it, it will in fact be a, a model building for others and for the kids. Yeah, I guess but, um, just to echo what Kathy said, the uh, energy use index or the EUI is uh, really important. And, and we're tracking that at slightly below 25, which is incredibly low, which will allow us to offset the energy use with the PV panels. And then your question about BE, yeah. Tim, do you wanna talk about that? Uh, mostly, uh, it was a change of a more expensive material to a more expensive material that you know, was equally durable. Uh, there were some other. Uh, Tim, I'm going to ask you, I'm having a hard time hearing you a little bit. I don't know if you can. Uh, what was that? Thank uh, you. There were. Most of the material changes, uh, there were some practical changes and I think that would affect the use operation of the building. Uh, things as simple as changing the location of where valves are in the classrooms from the terminal units to the corridor, which allows you to reduce piping, which is one of the things that has been heavily hit by inflation and commodity prices. So it was a considerable list, multiple pages along, which a lot of items that added up, but I mean, we went through this, the idea that none of it would affect the experience or use of the building from uh, most of the users. Uh, some more concrete examples would be like where we had curtains all that ran uh, above the cafeteria or the library where it wasn't used as window, it was essentially opaque. We changed that to a metal panel and uh, every square foot that you make that change, you're saving a significant amount of money. So if you do that enough times throughout the building, you can make those real savings without changing the floor area, without changing the spaces. It's uh, just a lot of little tweaks and cuts around the edge with material. 
of that energy. I know Sarah has some follow-up questions, but if it's okay, Sarah, we'll just ask Jay to go ahead. So uh, good morning, and thanks to the all the volunteers, people have said this before, but yeah, a massive project and a lot of good work. My question is about the the, the design, um, particularly the classroom configuration. And I was just wondering the extent to which this building is designed from the ground up for Amherst or whether there were things borrowed from other Danisco designs like the Howe Manning School in Middleton. It looks a little bit like Howe Manning to me, particularly the classroom configurations. I was wondering if you could say something about that. Yeah, thank you, um, Jay. We so so the square footage of the classrooms. Um, I don't think I don't know if we can get into the movie, but the square footage of the classroom is dictated by MSBA, right? So um, we have used previous experience as um, kind of a precedent for this. We have gone to other schools, not just Danisco schools with the school department to look at the various ways and configurations of classrooms. What you'll see is that they're typically uh, rectangular in shape. Um, this one, if you uh, pan out just a little bit more. Great, thank you. Um, Funny you mentioned how Manning, it, it, near and dear to, to our hearts, it's been so long. But um, what, what has changed in classrooms is um, we have two sinks. We have developed a system that provides storage behind that white marker board wall for the staff so that we can um, provide the storage required, but remove it from the floor so that the area within the classroom itself really just becomes um, a flexible learning environment for the students. We have lockers out in the project areas so that they're not inside the classroom. So again, the focus is the flexibility inside the classrooms. Um, but I, I think most classrooms, when you go through them, whether they're Danisco or others, are similar in nature, um, hopefully because the goal is to provide flexibility for differentiated learning. And I just have to ask, how do you know about how Manning? Uh, I do a little bit of consulting around the state and we're working with uh, Tritown. Oh, uh, yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for your response. Thank you. Sarah, you wanna come back? Sure, thank you. Um, so my two questions are related and um, might as well have this, I'll be very explicit. Can you talk about how the school protects uh, folks inside from intruders, either who are trying to get into the school or maybe have gotten as far as the front office? Can the academic wing be locked down at the press of a button? Um, and a little bit related to that, if I understand, understood correctly, it seems like most, or the kids who arrive by bus are not coming in by the front door, but by this side door. Um, and maybe it's just up to the staff to provide security at that entrance. But can you just comment about this on the security features? And Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, first and foremost on everyone's minds these days, right? Uh, unfortunately, but it's a reality. The, the arrival of the students, um, let me see, let me back up. We have uh, one, two, we have four access points into the building. We have the main vestibule to the west um, at the entry of the building. That's one. Tim, I don't know if you can be my eyes and ears, but there you go. We have stair B, which is the entrance for students um, entering through the uh, for buses, and that also could be uh, used for going out to the um, educational outdoor learning activities that occur south of the building. We also have a north vestibule uh, on the opposite side of that. Uh, per code, we need so many egresses 
and that will also allow students and staff to e and exit onto the fields. And then we have a rear stair uh, labeled stair C. So if we talk about hardware, um, the building will be locked and staff will be able to access these stairs through a FOB or a key card access. Everything will be key card access. Um, and the school department can determine who has those access, who has that, what access to what stairs, but assuming we haven't gotten to that point, every all staff have access in the building using these card accesses. Um, the vestibule at the main entry is designed so that you actually have to request entrance through, you know, the system that's currently there in a, a phone. You press a button, you announce yourself, this main office staff can see you. They actually have windows so they can see you arrive um, even before you press the button, but they'll have a monitor and they'll be able to say, yes, come on in. Um, once they enter the vestibule, which looks small here, but it's actually going to be large enough to, and, and comfortable. We want visitors to feel welcome when they arrive, but they actually will have the ability. There were two windows there that they can check visitors' credentials before they actually enter the building. The second, door, the second pair of doors will also be locked and the only way for visitors to enter the building will be if the main office staff let them into the building. Um, we do have some security features built in, whether it's for intruders or for fire, that we do have doors that are on hold opens, but that can also be shut um, with a push of a button. Can I ask a follow-up? Yes, please. Um, it looks to me as if um, if the doors uh, to the academic wing are locked, um, then the only way out for students on the second or third floor is downstairs C, and there is no elevator. I wonder if it is possible to add locking doors or a gate on the other side of that middle entrance. So I, <laughs> I'm using yeah. my cursor, no, 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 but no, nobody can there. see it, you know, between it looks like the elevator and the and a toilet across that that end of the hall, so that anyone in the academic wing could use all of that. It's still not an elevator, though. I guess the elevator is only in the community wing. Yeah, there's there is only one elevator, and your point is well taken. Students that um, the doors at the academic wing where the cursor is um, can be locked so that someone cannot enter those doors, but students can always exit those doors. Right, you always have yeah. to have two means of um, egress. Is that Rick wanting? Yes, to uh, go the, for it? the way the the building codes are, you can lock those doors on the ingress side, but they have to remain uh, open on the uh, for fire egress. The the doors would close for lockdown. The doors would close for fire. The stairway doors, the corridor. If you if you can go to the second floor. Yeah. So on the second floor, students would go through the doors down the stairs. You can always get into the stairs and then go back to the first floor and go directly outside for fire. Anytime you see doors swinging in, uh, that's egress and you have to allow people to go in and out. Go back to the first floor, Tim, please. So if you just look at stair B, on um, under lockdown, the doors to the academic wing would be locked from an intruder on the first floor. The uh, doors on stair B would be locked to go upstairs on this level because uh, that's possible. The doors to 
stair A would be locked so no one could go upstairs and they couldn't use the elevator. So the um, intruder would be kept to the admin area. Does that help Sarah explain that? I, I do understand that if the intruder is in the community or front at yeah. area, um, they would, mm -hmm. we would not utilize the yeah. elevator, um, but we will also have um, emergency um, kind of chairs to help in, in case of a fire. Um, also, also uh, bring students down in case of a fire or something, um, working with the um, first responders. I guess my, I would just ask um, if the doors, it shows swinging doors. I guess it's unclear to me, like where are they hinged? Are, <laughs> the doors are all shown so, they meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. I had it. Okay. Thank you. I had it backwards. Yeah. Sorry. It's this architectural speak. Well, right. Did, so um, are, are you comfortable with that response, Sarah? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Jenny? Thank you. I'm building on on what you you just got to in terms of accessibility and and exiting. Um, that that was exactly where but where my questions are. Kind of the flip side of of Sarah's points. Um, so seeing so many stairwells, um, I want to make sure that not just students but but teachers and and parents and family members with mobility um, impairments can get fully in and out of the school. And I know that's code. I know that's also part of the welcoming that you all have designed this, but can you point out, um, you know, if kids are coming in from vans, I guess they'll come in through the front door. It, is that north vestibule in, entrance flat? Um, if there were a fire um, or an, an emergency exit, is there a way to get people out of the academic wing um, without having to go back into that front? And I will also echo everyone's um, glee and gratitude for how this is going. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Tim, I don't know if you want to start. Um, first, I, I'll let maybe Tim talk a little bit about that. We, we do want to say that we have spent, uh, we've had several meetings with first responders, police, fire, EMTs, and we'll continue those conversations as we go forward. But Tim, do you want to talk a little bit about how how it's fully accessible? He's he's on mute. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, starting from the outside of the building, going in, there is a fully accessible path from the parking lot or both um, drop off loops to the building, including flush curves in certain areas for that egress route. Uh, the building itself, the approach, there are no slopes uh, beyond any, the or any of the doors. Uh, there is a ramp, uh, it's shaded green, it should be the color here. Uh, us, the first floor is, is a couple feet above grade, so this is a ramp with handrails, but otherwise it's a flat approach to all the doors. And then moving into the building, um, Elevator is centrally located. Uh, there, yes, there are three stairs uh, for mobility up and down through the building. But other than that, within the floors, other than the platform here uh, with a ramp to it, as well as stairs, there are no uh, changes in level at the floor anywhere in the building other than the platform at the cafeteria. And then at the second floor, uh, the media center is up a couple steps and a ramp. And the reason for that is to the ceiling height that you need in the cafeteria for performances. Uh, but other than those few changes in elevation throughout the building, all of the floor levels are flat with an elevator in the center, straight access to all of the entrance points, and then the space to that. Thank you.
Claire. Um, speaking of accessibility, I just, um, I am not a educational professional in any sense, and um, I have not followed all this planning, but if you could speak briefly to how all the educational needs of our elementary schools have been incorporated into this building. I'm seeing things that I don't know what they mean. Um, and you don't have to explain all of them, but obviously we have a lot of educational um, focuses and, and needs that are addressed. And I, I just wanna make sure that you can assure us that um, we won't have someone pop up later and say, hey, we left out you know, this or that. I just would like to hear um, how that experience has gone. Um, th thank you. And, and Superintendent Morris is on the call as well. But um, the educational program truly drove the design. There is an extremely well-written document that explains how instruction is taught, um, what the needs are, the staff's requirements, which then inform the design and the layout of the building. Um, the Caminantes program is an incredibly important uh, feature in the educational program. And we're able to actually expand it by having two classrooms per grade be part of the Caminantes program. Um, all of the support spaces and needs, whether it's literacy specialists, math specialists, we have um, your ELL program, which is independent of the dual language program, also recognizing the needs for that. But we have spoken to, I think, every kind of like department or, or specialty within, within the district to ensure that the spaces are designed, laid out, and located um, appropriately as related to this to the educational program. And Mike, I'll I'll let you talk about you'll never need anything different. <laughs> right. I think uh, a couple of things. Thanks for the question, Claire. So um a couple of things that there was a lot of engagement. We did have multiple meetings with different staff members over the course of the design process. We tried to do it right at the end of the day to be able to capture more of their thoughts. There was a lot, multiple electronic surveys for people who couldn't attend those. So we did have lots of access points for folks who are on the ground to look at the designs and weigh in. And I think in particular, thinking about some of the more specialized programming, there was more explicit meetings with Caminantes with some of our intensive special needs programs. Uh, around design principles that that we thought was important. Uh, we did have uh, Allison Estes, assistant principal at Wildwood, and Tammy uh, Salvadelli, principal at Fort River, on the leadership team. So we also had a direct link uh, through the school leaders uh, around that. I think to the larger question you ask, I think, uh, right, we can't prevent people from saying, what about this, what about that? But they've been doing that throughout, and we've been able to integrate to the best of our abilities those kind of, those kind of pieces of feedback into design. But, but I also think uh, I've been really appreciative of the design principles around adaptability and flexibility that, you know, this building is intended to last at least 50 years. And so knowing that educational trends 25 years from now may look different than what they are right now, there's a lot of flexibility that is, is designed into the building. So this is the current design in terms of what we expect the spaces to be. Um, but there's a real focus and, uh, and I appreciate Don and your team and Tim and uh, other folks who have been part of the design to say, you know, if trends change or if there's some different needs in the future, how can rooms be flexed for different purposes uh, down the road? So, you know, I think it's it's been designed well in terms of addressing current needs, but also that we don't end up in a situation where, oh, actually we want to use this, you know, STE room for something else that's impossible. It's, it's, it's been designed so that, you know, some, there is some interchangeability, I know that's not a real word, but you know, you can follow what I'm saying, uh, between the spaces designed so that we can, you know, adjust and uh, along the times, I think the counter example to what we had with Fort River and Wildwood, which had to be, you know, walls put up and walls put down and all those changes, it just wasn't designed with flexibility in mind. And, and this building really does have that uh, sort of built into the, into the recipe or into the cake. So really appreciate the design, but definitely the right question to ask. So Claire, I really appreciate that, but it certainly is being thought about not just in terms of the materials to last 50 plus years, but also from a design principle perspective to also last that long, because we know things will change over time.
Okay. Yeah, I had um, one last question, perhaps. I can't read all of the small labels there, but I was wondering if um, the Department of Ed has signed off on the location of the SPED spaces, because what I'm seeing here, it kind of looks like some of the um, special ed areas and alternative learning mm -hmm. areas and so forth are pushed to one end of the building instead of being integrated with the, the spaces for typical learners. And I could be reading this wrong, but I was wondering if you could comment on that. Sure. Um, no, uh, Desi has a uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for, for everyone who is not into all these crazy acronyms, uh, has not um, signed off yet. That's part of the submission. Um, we believe strongly that the educational program fully articulates the needs for inclusivity. And we believe that um, we, we have done so in a thoughtful manner, also recognizing the need for accessibility um, and, and being mindful of these students. The, you, you are looking correctly at the dark purple is the special education spaces. Many of them are pullout spaces and or staff. So at the far end, far east of or, or on the far right, it's a psych office. It's not a learning space. It's you know really the psychologist's office. So we don't anticipate that being an issue whatsoever, as well as um, some of the other small spaces. The <clears throat> main focus is the special education kind of self-contained or um, dedicated spaces that are fully integrated uh, with their peers. And Mike, I, I don't know if you want to chime in more. We look forward, I'll just say, and we also look forward to any responses that we have from Desi. They have reviewed the educational program and, and they were quite pleased with it. So yeah. I'm, I'm comfortable with this. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think the only thing I'll add is, you know, Matt Deniger is, is the DESI rep. Um, he has a large background on the MSD board. He has a large background and interest in um, integration and special education. Uh, we have a lot of co-teaching in our classrooms and schools. So it was really, these were designed to provide sufficient um, quiet spaces uh, that some of our students need with close access to classrooms. Um, and you can see they're not necessarily grouped um, being adjacent to each other. In other words, there's no cluster of, oh, the specialized programs are all in the southwest corner of the second floor. They're spread out so that students can be more integrated, which in general is what DESI uh, tends to like to see. And we'll be open to that feedback. And um, that's part of the iterative process that MSB has, which you know yields better results. So I think uh, that's the only thing I'd add to what Donna said. I agree with everything, uh, everything else. OK, thank you. You know, and I might just add, I'm a member of the building committee and I'm not of the school committee and teaching, but as we watched the layout, Jay, of the classrooms change, uh, many times it was because there'd been input from the special needs teachers on where to put this feature, where to put that feature uh, in terms of the layout, uh, to think about where it's near classrooms, where it's at one end, the Eastern end or the Western end. So there was a lot of back and forth um, that the those floor plans would shift, <clears throat> not driven by us, by, but, but driven by input of the teachers. Okay, thank you. Donna, you're, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Sarah was asking if the slides have been posted. Uh, they have not yet. Um, they will, and we can, because we have a movie embedded in our presentation, what we can do is, is also just provide that movie so people can um, visually experience it themselves as well. And, and Donna, we can add back in the sustainability slide, the one that, that the one that we talked about, but but somehow disappeared, um, which gives some of the specifics on what what about this building makes it net zero and the sustainability side. Yeah.
I'm, I'm, I see uh, one more hand. Tony has raised her hand on. Tony, you're muted. Sorry, I think I'd have that figured out by now. Um, just echoing everybody's appreciation of all the work that's gone into this, and it is a beautiful looking building, and I've been following it from the start, and it's been great watching it develop. I just wanted to make a plug, following up from Sarah Marshall's excellent questions about security, the music areas oh, are just in from um, the lobby, which is sort of reminiscent of where the art room is in Wildwood right now, which has been identified as a security concern, a vulnerability. Um, so I wonder if there's a way to move the music areas back upstairs like they were at the PSR stage. And I was just you know, looking at where are the single story areas in the building that potentially the music areas could be moved above. And it seems to be either the admin at the front or the custodial areas behind the, the gym. They seem to be one story also. And, and if the music areas were back on the second floor, it would have them nicely next to the other specials, um, art and steam and the library. And, uh, and it would just be that extra security behind those um, stair B and stair A secure doors. I just want to make a plug for exploring move, moving those air, music rooms back upstairs like they were earlier. Thank you. Uh, Rudy. Hi. Um, whoop, let me get my camera going there. Uh, I also wanted to just uh, commend the school building committee and the Danisco team for giving us uh, oh. a, uh, an exciting new new school. And this is a pretty good school. I like the fact that. Hello. <laughs> um, and I, I think this would be well worth the money, even if we were just getting this fantastic school out of our investment. But I look at this as a actually a four part investment for the community's future that really is cost effective as a result. First, it gets us this fantastic new school that's very inclusionary, um, much better school than what we have for either uh, of our two schools now. It um, also is a critical early investment in this our first net zero building which will not only give us this wonderful model of that for our community and and hopefully spur other communities and so forth and people in our own community are building buildings but um it also takes out uh, a building that's been an energy hawk that will be removed from our our carbon footprint which is fantastic double value on that front um Thirdly, it's a, a great investment in upgrading community recreational assets there in the community fields that will be significantly improved by this investment. And lastly, and we haven't talked about this that much, the NISCO team has been making small design features to make sure this can be used as a temporary shelter for our community during you know, power outages or storm uh, incidents. This will have backup power. It'll have bathrooms. It'll have lighting throughout that can be powered independently from the grid. So we're getting four great uh, assets by this investment. And um, largely that's because we've had good a good design team and a great committee working on this. So Hats off, and uh, I, I strongly support this. I'm looking forward to seeing it evolve. Thanks. So I'm I'm not seeing any other hands up, Donna. Um, you know, I'm not sure who's moderating, but I just want to. Several people who have spoken now have been, uh, as they noted, with us from the beginning. So we've had. A building committee and we've got another building committee who also um, has regularly reviewed and and we really encourage and have been welcoming both questions and comments um, and as I said um, on Monday night when we did a presentation with the council that to the extent you have questions or are hearing questions or comments please send them I mean if you send them to me 
um, we're, we're working on an expanded question and answer uh, document, um, both the things we hear tonight. Um, some of them may spark thinking as we're, we're looking at design. So we have tried to be a really open process. And one of the things we did during uh, the committee is when we take the committee minutes and, and note comments that need answers, we've tried to also provide the answers to the committee if things were brought up. So we've been trying to do a constant feedback loop. So I really welcome that. And I just wanna, Tony mentioned the music rooms and I know when we originally discussed them, one of the reasons for the location was because we have a cafetorium with a stage and the thought was the stage will be a place where people can perform. And if you didn't notice in the design, you can walk right from the music practice rooms onto the stage. So we thought that was a really nice feature for the music teachers and the students, including performances while the kids are eating. So we're trying to take into account how we're using the school and how we might want to be using the school goes into this larger, pretty complex equation. So we, we really do welcome um, the input and uh, it, Margaret and Donna quickly said, you know, if we get past the getting to the financing part, this the design is not fixed in stone. Those outdoor spaces um, are diagrammed, but thought has gone into them, but we haven't going all the way on what play equipment's going to be there where exactly will certain pieces be how much will the kids be involved in building some of the structures that are on the outside so i think this is it's i said at my outset this is a pivotal point and a big step but it's not the end it's it's still a journey um for the school and we really welcome everybody participating I see Sarah's hand is back up. So that was my closing, <laughs> closing remark, Sarah, but um, I think we can take one more quick one. Well, or or I'll get the answer another time. I know there was a schedule shown briefly, but if you could describe what, if any, additional design work is happening between now and May 2nd, or basically none, you're just like preparing the submissions to MSBA. Thank you. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the design that, Denisco has presented is the design that will be included in the submission to the MSBA. And that's because it's tied to a vast number of documents that all need to be linked together and accurate, including the estimate and the, and the building program documents. So I, I want to thank everyone who joined us this morning as particularly since I had to figure out how to join. So it clearly, um, we made it accessible. This will be repeated again tomorrow night at 6.30. So if you have friends, neighbors, other people you know, please encourage them to come. Um, and uh, we, we, it will not be the only time we're taking this out. We plan to have district meetings at the council level. I've identified some large places with a lot of people who live there um, willing to go out. UMass is interested in presentations as well. So thank you very much. Um, uh, any 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 final pieces, Paul, that you want to say? You know, and I will say our state legislators have been following this actively, both Mindy and Joe, and they're uh, Sarah mentioned the potential grants that are from the federal, but we've also been talking to them about what might be available because we are a net zero school and it's a sustainable building. Mike. Yeah, if I could just, I really want to thank the larger community for the support so far in this project. This is uh, in the end, and Kathy, you always do a great job reminding us this is about kids. <laughs> Uh, and this is providing about providing the best educational experience for, for the children in Amherst. And so I just am incredibly enthusiastic. I want to thank you, Kathy, for your leadership uh, of the building committee, as well as the building committee as a whole, but the larger committee too, because we've gotten tremendous amount of feedback throughout, uh, you know, the building committee meetings and all that feedback uh, is deeply considered and we've made changes that have made the project better. So, you know, the project's better because of the engagement of the community. We appreciate, I appreciate everyone coming here today, but I really do and they, I'm responsible for the education of, of all the kids in the Amherst Public Schools. And I just want to share my enthusiasm. I believe this project will improve the education, uh, educational experience of that and provide a much better teaching environment and uh, for our, staff, our hardworking staff as well. So 
Uh, I just want to share my enthusiasm for going forward. I more just answered questions, but uh, I think it was important for me to be able to, you know, share that with folks. Well, we do believe this will make this will be a game changer for the education we're able to provide to kids in Amherst. We appreciate the community bearing with us. It's a, you know, it feels like a slog, and then we come out with a lot of information, and then we go back and work, and and it, it's an iterative process, but we end up with a better product because of that. So appreciate everyone's patience and support so far, and I'm really excited for the next couple of months as we move forward. Thank you all. Um, and uh, we're adjourned for today. Stay tuned for tomorrow at 6.30. <laughs> Thank you.